started. Let's give these brothers one more hand, please. Some 
way what it was that we were about. Well, first off, you know, I was in the black struggle. And I don't want to just define it as Black Panther Party, although I was a member of the Black Panther Party. It was a broad struggle. And so, uh, uh, you know, uh, I don't want to demean anybody that was in the NAACP or that was in SNCC or any other organization, because at that time, it was, it was a broad spectrum of, uh, of, of organizations and people that were trying to move for self-determination and control of their own uh, destinies. You know, as uh, Malcolm X, uh, who was a mentor to not only the Black Panther Party, but most of the black organizations at that time, you know, he preached black nationalism and self-determination and trying to uh, 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 control your own destiny. And uh, by no means do I want anybody to think that uh, I'm a bad guy. There's plenty of Negroes better than me. You know what I mean? There's plenty of them. You know, so I'm not, and I'm not Jim Brown. I'm not Shaq. I'm not going to jump through the window. I'm not going to do none of that. I'm just a normal black man that got surrounded by the police and had to fight for his life. something that I'm not, because you'd be sadly disappointed. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, if I'd have had my druthers, I'd have ran. You know, so so that, that's, that's the gist of that. But no, seriously, uh, uh, for the youth, I, I, I want to try to dispel that gun image, mm -hmm. because I look at that gun image that we created as part of some of the problems because the power structure is turning that upon ourselves. And, and what I mean by that is in the film you've heard of COINTELPRO and COINTELPRO is still working. You know, and uh, in every major black city we've had crack epidemics, we've had uh, uh, gang warfare that, that really doesn't make any sense. How can we come, go from everybody's brother to being a thug mm -hmm. in 20 years. I mean, how does that happen? You know, how do we go from black power to uh, 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 cocaine power in 20 years? You know, how does that happen? So we have to understand that these things are presented to us, and the power structure knows that 80% of the people are going to take the easy way out. So they put the easy way out there for that 80%. You see, and this is what destroys our communities. And this is what destroys us as a people. So we have to recognize, we have to watch this film and recognize the struggles of, of, of Kathleen Cleaver and Eldridge Cleaver and Geronimo Pratt and Bunchy Carter and we picked up the gun for a reason. And I can stand on this stage and say that I've never shot a black man. I have never shot. You know what I mean? And I will not. A Negro told me the other day, he said, Man, call the police. He was acting crazy, right? I said, I ain't never called the police on my life in my life. You know what I mean? I mean, I'll deal with you if it comes to that, but I ain't calling the police. You know what I'm saying? You know, so you check yourself. And, and we have to, you know, just recognize that this is not being bad. About being real. So, you know, and we have to explain to the youth, you know, and I'm really against this, uh, and then I'm gonna be finished. I'm against this uh, this uh, super bad nigga image that placed on our youth. You know what I mean? Where we, uh, I mean, you know, I look at some of these movies, uh, this last movie that came out with Wesley Snipes and, and all these guys in it about Brooklyn police. Right. At first I said to myself, you know, it's action, I'm a man. That was a good movie, that was a good movie. Then I got home, and I started thinking about it. I said, about 30 niggas got killed in that movie. I said, that wasn't no good movie. I said, shit, you know what, but wait a minute. This is the dehumanizing aspect that the system constantly put on black life 
not only in America, but all around the world. You know, where you just kill, kill, kill. And, and, and that's not what we about. If it wasn't for black people, I wouldn't be here. You understand? So I know there's love in the community, and there's love that we have for each other, and we have to recognize that and promote that, and try to dispel this negative image that, that, that our weak brothers and thinking fall prey to. Because they fall prey to that image, then the prison system locks them up, then they give them 25 years to life, and I'm going to end on this note. What's the fastest growing business in America? Right. My entry into this uh, came from the fact that first I was born in 1966, so obviously I wasn't part of the subject, but I was part of the group of people, like many of us here, for whom the baton was passed. The soundtrack for that passing was in the 1980s when many veterans of the movement were involved in study groups, bookstores. The soundtrack for that passing of the baton was songs like Don't Believe the Hype, you know, like um, KRS-One, you, you know, like You Must Learn. All of that was happening. And the people that taught me that it was cool to read were all veterans of the movement in my hometown, Rochester, New York. So I started on this journey of writing on the Black Power Movement, not knowing necessarily where it would end. But I think what's special about it for our generation going forward is that this is a special moment where you have the kind of intergenerational dialogue. How many activists in the 1960s would have had a moment like this with former Garveyites? Right? So, as far as the advantages of this time, that's why I don't really necessarily go for this thing of nobody's doing anything, look at how, because you also have special moments like this. And the research that I've done, I feel is very much a part of that special moment of creating a dialogue. All of our elders are here with us, and uh, Brother Greg would say, and has said, every young person needs to find a way to record the voices, memories and lessons of our elders, and I'm glad that have been a part of that very important part of the struggle. Uh, Brother Farr just mentioned, uh, in fact, Brother Farr and I, we were talking uh, on the way here from Los Angeles about the uh, um, Jim Crow era, um, which really was a transition around 1964, um, right before the revolts. And I think we have to remember that <clears throat> this particular period of time, uh, from 1965 uh, through uh, the 1970s, was a period um, that presented a leap in consciousness among our people. And this was a time when uh, we were, we were, you know, young people, teenagers, we were 19, 20, 21, 22 years old. And so we were a part of this movement to transform consciousness, to transform social conditions in our communities. And we had the aspiration of actually building a nation of people. And so this is the vision that we came into this period with. The film points out certain moments that happened during that period that were unforgivable moments. They were <clears throat> moments that we wish we could take back. But at the same time, we have to remember, as Brother Farr pointed out, the vision that we came to this with. And this is the vision, this is why we are here. This is the responsibility that we accept to come here and to share with you, those of you who are of the generation of Greg Everett. And, and I admire Greg for taking on this project um, because it's very important for us to share and let you know what it was, what it felt like for us to come into this period and to help transform our communities. And so this is, as Brother Scott pointed out, we accepted the baton, and we have to pass the baton on. 
to another generation. And this is why we sit here so that we can try to inspire in you those things that were inspirational in us to help transform our communities. Because the struggle continues. You know, the struggle has not ended. The struggle is not dead. The struggle continues. And so this is why we're here today. As you were saying, your mother gave you and exposed you to that, and then you linked up to and took and influenced, as, as uh, Dr. Scott said, influenced him and other young brothers. Now, you're like a bridge to the youth who are now. What do you think that, what do you think folks need to see, need to think about, need to do, and how do you feel about you and other brothers in that who the bridge between these generations? And what mission is still left for you, and what should folks younger than should be doing? What kind of young musicians, rappers? Um, what's what's happening with them? What do they need to pay attention to this? And how do you feel about where we are at this point? Well, first of all, I have to say, um, Greg, that, that man, that, that the film is a hard one to take for me, and it's a beautiful film. It's very hard to take too. Um, it's like it pieced some parts of a puzzle that was in my head and my upbringing that made sense. I heard of the names and I, you know, later on you backtrack and you read the information, but uh, that was a, a, a revisitation into an emotion. I mean, you brought the emotion of that period. And I think that's really important. It, it, for, I wouldn't even say younger people, it's for everybody, that our history does, does not get, you know, misplaced or, or, or just, forgotten, but it takes fighting with it. You have to have a fight for it. Because like Brother Frost said, I mean, the COINTELPRO is viral as a mom. You know what I mean? It's viral more than ever. It, you know, one of the fights in the Black Panther Party is a fight for education. And, and, and Malcolm X said it best, as my wife says all the time, it's like, you know, every, every year or every phase or every generation, racism comes out every year like a new model car. So we got to recognize exactly what to fight for, how to define freedom. Freedom to some people is having things, but you don't have yourself. Before it was like the fight to have yourself. Now people say, well, now we have a black president, we have things. So we have everything except for ourselves. And that's the definition of freedom. How you convey and get it across to people. I won't say young people, because the youth is no excuse. First 10 years of my life, this was necessary because it was your life. It was your community, it was your neighborhood. So it was no excuse to say, I'm, I'm too young. I brought my, my nephews here, they, they friends, and they, they had a good time popping in the pool, and my mother says, get your little asses up out of the pool, we're gonna check out a movie that might have zoomed past their head from 40 years ago. But the fight is, if it's gonna be for education, and be it through the arts and culture or whatever, you lace it, how, how do you make it viral into the minds of everybody who's sitting in a captive chair in an educational system that gives you nothing? Doesn't even give you yourself. You people go to school to, to in order so they can get some dying dollar to get things. So all this has come to pass. The economy is dropping down. Healthcare is, it, it, is not even a thought. You know, all these things are coming to ashes. And we don't have ourselves. And we need to recognize that what to fight for, but it got to come from the emotion. And this film hits an emotion to start. It's a spark for a plug, but you got to fight for it. And you got to define what your fight is for. You know, and my last statement is that the fight in my next 10 years of my life is maybe making a fight and saying, okay, what stops the sewage? coming through the mass media to make you ignore and not even think about this. What stops you from rolling on the V103 in this town, which gives you nothing? Or Kathy Hughes Network, or people that you're afraid to name because you're afraid that it might inflict upon your dollar or your job. You can't stop the sewage leaking into people we can't present something, and we can't even reinforce something in a climate that's so bad for us to make something so emotionally you know, felt for us to begin the fight. So I think COINTEL is very viral in today's media. And somebody might just throw up, oh, media. Uh, that's just something superficial. Media has turned into 
the Pied Piper, which makes us ignore even people in our own household that we can talk to and influence. Can you roll up on a radio station? Can you roll up on a TV network with the same passion that somebody actually went to? The, because number one, if you do that, you rest assured you're gonna see the police again. <laughs> They're gonna arrest your ass because you're rolling up on a communication center. And when countries get taken over in parts of the world, first place they go to is the communications network. Now we know it's more complex. It's TV, radio, and now it's the intranet, as people <laughs> miss say. But you better realize how to stop that sewage in order for you to begin the fight for the minds and the souls and the existence of us as human beings. I wonder, a lot of people, you are a young sister. What made you, what, where did you get the passion, the drive to say, I'm going to be a producer of this film, I'm going to try to make this happen, then I'm going to go knock on the door of the Pan African Film Festival, National Black Arts Festival, and say, get this, help me get this out. Where did you get that passion? Where did you get that energy? And uh, where can other folks go get that same passion and energy? Well, I would have to admit, I didn't get it from my mom. I got all my passion from my husband, Gregory. Aww. He was to read books, because I wasn't even reading books when I met him. <laughs> he, his first, the first book he ever gave me was a Taste of Power from Elaine Brown. And I give all my thoughts to him. The collaboration between the Pan African Film Festival and the National Black Arts Festival is because we believe what you're saying, Brother Chuck D, that the National Black Arts Festival is an attempt to create an alternative communication system and let folks know, see, hear, and get some energy from this space and then carry that out and carry it forward and try to create it. It's a conscious effort to bring films like this to this city and around the country. Because we know that creating this kind of atmosphere and bringing this kind of film here, then Gregory can take this energy, give him some energy, give everybody up here some energy, and then go push this and get it on PBS so me and people can see, get it into the public school system. Everybody who's here, who's teaching, or goes to, be, or te goes to the PTA meetings, make sure that you follow this film on the internet, Make sure you get that film. Say, so I want to have this film in my library. I want to have this film in my school. I want to have this film all over. And that's how films get out there. That's how you make it happen and how people carry this, the message.